Hi everybody, this is Chris Campbell with the Food Institute, and welcome back to another episode of the Food Institute podcast. This week we welcome a very special guest, Mike Colomeco, probably best known for his TV series, Mike Colomeco's Real Food, and we're going to talk about some changes that he's seen in the New York dining scene over the last couple of years through the pandemic and even from the start of his career. But before we get started, I really want to thank all of our listeners for tuning in week after week, and I want to ask you to share this episode with your friends and family. We find that word-of-mouth referrals are still the best way to get our name out there, so we really ask that you send this over to any of your friends, family, colleagues that have an interest in the food industry. Uh, Really appreciate it when you do so, so thank you once again. And with that all out of the way, I'd like to introduce Mike and ask him how he's doing today. So welcome to the show, Mike. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me. Well, I really am excited to have this conversation with you because I do think, you know, a lot of the Food Institute audience might be a little bit more focused on the larger parts of the food industry. But I do think that New York City kind of serves as a barometer for the uh, industry overall. So I'm really excited to take a look into this. And I was hoping that you could give us just kind of an overview of where you think the restaurant industry is now that we're kind of going into the waning days of the pandemic, really starting to look at that post pandemic period for the first time. So could you give us that 10,000 foot view, you know, of the New York restaurant scene right now? From the public side, everybody is clamoring to go out to eat again to, you know, whether it's eating on the sidewalk or going indoors, because, again, in New York, thank God, the numbers are are really down in terms of infections. The city just feels, I mean, a year ago, it was like the plague, and we didn't know whether we should touch the elevator button or, you know, with six feet masks far enough. And, you know, now where we are is let's get back to normal. Let's sit at the bar. Let's get you know. Let's see a menu. Let's order food. Let's let's live our lives again. So the demand side is is absolutely febrile. I think the problem is going to be staffing. You know, everywhere I look, restaurants are everybody I know is hiring. Everyone I know, whether you follow them on social media or bump into them on the street, that's the question. That's kind of where the pinch point is in the hourglass is ramping up staffing to get enough front of the house, to get enough back of the house, to get enough of the in between food runners, prep cooks, and all that to actually make a, make a restaurant run like the engine it's supposed to be. So that's, that's going to be the challenge for, I think, the next five or six months, if not longer. And I think that's probably, you know, a problem across the United States right now. And we're seeing a lot of national food service operators raising their wages significantly. Uh, you know, like I said, even in the fast food sector. So, you know, how is that going to affect, you know, wages and fine dining establishments? Do you think this is going to have any kind of, you know, upward pressure to try to increase those wages? Or is this something that, you know, they're going to be you know, somewhat apart from? It already has. Um, when I, again, so I'm on the street um, in, in, in social media, I bike to Union Square and shop. I mean, where I live in the Lower East Side, so I'm literally bumping into chefs and restaurateurs all the time. Uh, and And with across the board, everybody is now saying, okay, I mean, one of the dirty secrets of the industry has been that the back of the house, the kitchen staff, have just been woefully underpaid. I mean, you're you're asking people to work in Manhattan or Brooklyn in a restaurant to work five, probably six day shifts. And pre-COVID, you know, what was the pay? I don't know, $14, $15, $13 an hour, whatever, for an entry-level cook. You you do the math for rents in New York. You really, you can't afford to sustain yourself. And yet, we were all just, that was what the industry was. And now I'm hearing chefs and restaurant owners saying, you know, we're starting people at $18, $20 an hour. We're trying to create a much more humane workplace I was talking to a chef friend of mine the other day who's looking for people. He said, you know, we're going to have five-day shifts for the for the kitchen staff, front of the house too, but we're talking about the kitchens here. We're going to do five-day shifts instead of six. Uh, in the summer, we're going to adjust our schedules. Maybe we're going to close on the weekend or close two days. You're going to get two days off back-to-back. I mean, they're trying to create a more humane atmosphere because the the restaurant industry has always just been, I don't want to say ex exploiting but it, i mean it really has been the back of that when, when i came up as a as a as a young cook and a lot of those kitchens were union back in the 80s i mean they're not now but they were then it didn't matter you work 65 hours a week and you got paid for 35 and that's just what you did and the chef would say i'll give you an extra week off in the summer or some kind of just you know something that didn't go near compensating what you were doing but if you said no there was a line, a stack of resumes a foot tall that were going to replace you. And the industry's always lived like that, and especially on the high end. 
I mean, you look at, you know, the, the per se's of the world and 11 Madisons and what percentage of their kitchen stagiaires that are working for free. We did it. I mean, I went to Europe and worked for free. We all do it like a badge of honor. Um, you learned a lot, but, you know, basically you're not getting paid and you're learning out of your pocket. So, yeah, I think we're going to see totally we're going to see upward pressure. And and the industry really should be paying the back of the house people what they're worth. And they haven't been. So it, that adjustment's going to be painful. Uh, consumers are probably going to have to pay more. Or we're going to have to figure out how to do that with the bottom line. But, yeah, absolutely. The, the back of the house staff is now super short staffed and they're going to have to make more money. And I guess I just have a question regarding, you know, that labor force. Um, you know, we saw something of an exodus from New York and a lot of major cities during the pandemic, people moving out into rural or, you know, suburban areas trying to get a little bit more spread out. And I have a feeling that you will probably say that it's not going to affect it too much. But does this really change, you know, the sphere where innovative new food service ideas come from when you see this kind of spreading out? Or do you think it's still going to be, you know, kind of concentrated in the cities around the U.S. where we get these new, exciting, you know, fine dining concepts kind of emerging? I wish I had like a two sentence answer for that. Um, cities will always be incubators for talent and experimentation and energy. And anyone that you know, people who were counting New York out six months ago, I was telling them, you're crazy. I've lived in New York since 1982 through the stock market crash of 87, the various dot-com bubbles, 9-11, you name it. And this New York just has this ability to just come back roaring strong. So that's not going to change. But to your other point, when I look back again to my early time as a chef, my wife, the girlfriend then and I, she's a chef as well. We used to go to Europe every summer and eat at Michelin restaurants. That's what everybody did. It's where you got ideas. That's where you where you learn how to, you know, what was what fine dining could be. Because honestly, what they were doing then was so much better than the best restaurants in America. And you would come back with this bon bagage of ideas. And, you know, we didn't have cameras, but you'd have pictures. And what was crazy was most of those three-star restaurants throughout France and Germany and Italy were in the middle of nowhere. You know, some were in Paris, but the majority weren't. And you're seeing that in America now. I think we've really we've come such a long way in one generation as a food culture from, say, the 1980s to now. You know, like the French laundries in Yonville, California. Nobody knew where Yonville was until Thomas Keller put his stake in the ground there. Uh, David Kinch, Manresa, you know, middle of middle of nowhere, California, the in little Washington. Uh, you, so you're definitely going to see talent leaving the city. Gavin Kaysen was Danielle Bouloud's right hand guy for years at, at Danielle. And he wanted to go home to Minneapolis and open up a great restaurant. So are you really going to, I think you're going to see this cross pollinization of talent leaving cities. Maybe it was COVID. Maybe they just wanted to go home and opening up great restaurants in places that weren't known for that. And that's kind of a natural evolution, I think. And I saw it in Europe 30, 40 years ago, and we're starting to see it here in the States too. Yeah, and I think, you know, with the advent of social media over the last, you know, 10, 15 years, you actually have the opportunity to kind of have that clout that you would have being in New York, you know, anywhere in the country, as long as your product's good enough and you can market it correctly. So it'll be interesting to see, you know, if people are able to, you know, move out of the New York City region and, you know, or, you know, LA, you know, all the major hotspots in the United States and see if they can kind of create this new, you know, fine dining persona in areas that were not typically associated with it. Yeah, that's all the fine dining, all the fine dining in America up until I just arbitrarily, let's say, you know, the, the early was in cities. You once you crossed the Hudson River, once you left San Francisco, once you pulled out of Vegas onto what interstate, whatever, you were in no man's land. You know, it was like diners and fast food and junk. And now that's not the case. I mean, there's really talented bakers craftspeople, chefs opening up all around the country and, and really invigorating those cities. And I don't think that's going to change at all because our our taste, our, our our passion for food, that's one great thing about America, right? When we get into something, we go all in. And we have with food in the last generation. And we're seeing the dividends now where there's just people are into it all across the country. And if you're if you're really good and you have a great idea and you can deliver, you, you're probably going to do well anywhere these days, which wasn't the case 25, 30 years ago. And on the topic of doing well, we talked about this a little bit with, you know, rising wages, but also we're seeing food prices on the rise as well. Uh, and at the Food Institute, we've been tracking it. Obviously, there's a lot of talk about inflation overall, but just about the prices for everything from cleaning equipment to food supplies to, you know, 
even clothing that you're going to be having your workers working in, all of this seems to be on the rise. So I was wondering, you know, in an industry that's pretty historically known for its razor thin margins, how can a restaurant contend with these upwards pressures, really? Is it possible to remain profitable without passing on a price increase? Or is that something that just about every restaurant is going to have to look at going forward? I think you hit the nail on the head with the last sentence. I don't, there, razor thin profits is exactly the MO. I mean, restaurants operate on single digits, often below 5%. But you go back to the old days in the 80s in New York City, you know, rent was cheap, labor was cheap, ingredients were cheap. Now, all, all of those things have gone out of whack. Uh, I, I, yeah, I think you're going to have to see prices increasing. I do. I don't think restaurants can be. I mean, look at beef. I know you guys are probably right in the front row for this. In the last year, year and a half, feedlot operators who basically raised the cattle to pre-slaughter weight to, you know, three, 400 pounds less, but who were really in charge there, they're losing money selling cattle. And J JBS, Tyson, National, and Cargill, they're making record profits. So we're seeing, you know, on the, on the, on the supply side, the, the cattlemen and women are, aren't making any money at all, and the consumer's paying more. Wholesale prices for beef are probably up 30 40 percent, and and the big four are just killing it. So how is that? Well, they control 80 percent of the market, which is how that's possible. So there's going to be, I mean, I think there's going to be pressure that way too. I think the government's actually looking at that. It, interestingly, not as a sidebar, I mean, in chicken, Tyson and Pilgrim's Pride settled the price-fixing lawsuit about a year ago. You know, they just say, okay, yeah, we were we were price fixing. We did it. Happened in Cantuna. Same story. But I think for restaurants, the I don't I don't think they're going to be able to maintain. Not you know not sit down restaurants that are trying to serve high concept food, but you're going to see you know maybe leading you to another question. I think you're going to see sort of a growth in fast casual now as well as people have are expanding what the dining options are going to be and looking at price points. And this whole concept of ghost kitchens is something. Who who heard of those a year and a half ago? Yeah, so ghost kitchens are definitely an interesting avenue. And I'd like to actually add that into the conversation in a little bit. But I think one thing that we can kind of follow up on here is when you start seeing these kinds of price increases on different food items, does it cause a head chef to rethink the major, like the menu overall? Is yeah. this something that yeah. we go and say, hey, I'm going to source a different type of product, maybe just cut this completely because I can't sell it? You know, what kind of thinking goes into a decision like that? Yeah, all the above. I mean, if you're trying to maintain a food cost that's reasonable so that you can still be profitable, yeah. So maybe you're not going to be serving, if you have beef on the menu, it's not going to be all, you know, loin cuts. It's not going to be all porterhouses and 12 ounces. You're going to figure out other ways to butcher the animal, other cuts that work well that are less expensive, smaller portion sizes for the protein. Um, you know, Americans are still funny with fish. We basically eat tuna, uh, salmon, and, and, and shrimp is like the big three. But, you know, there's wonderful fish in markets that aren't that expensive. And I think that's what chefs are going to do. And shrinking protein, down, shrinking protein sizes down as well a little bit. You know, uh, there's always going to be steakhouses. There's always going to be places where you're going to go and drop big money for big portions. But more and more when I'm out now, I, I see the size of what's on the plate not getting minuscule, but it's, it's definitely shrinking for a reason. So not just the animal protein or, you know, the main part of the dish, it's the entire dish or over, overall you're saying is kind of shrinking down a little bit or. Yeah. I think people are just trying to source better ingredients and more expensive. I mean, you know, one of the reasons you never used to see and still don't in a way uh, a lot of vegetables as part of a main course, as part of an entree presentation, was, you know, there's just a lot of prep. Vegetables are more expensive than people think. And then you think of, like, those leafy greens. I'm sure you've cooked at home. You know, you, you buy a head of, of escarole or Swiss chard, and you clean it and wash it and spin it and dry it, and then you put it in a sauté pan. And what looked like a colander full of leafy greens is now, you know, four tablespoons. So <laughs> across the board, it's it's expensive. I think, But, but yeah, chefs are just going to have to get really creative in in stretching proteins, in utilizing really good vegetables, maybe throwing grains and other stuff there to get you sort of that sense that you're that you're sated and full. But the uh, to keep menu prices down in this pressure is going to be almost impossible. And so on the other hand, you know, we we're just talking about the animal proteins and how a lot of restaurants have really relied on that to be the center plate option when they're, you know, serving up meals to their guests. But earlier this year, we saw that 11 Madison Park really made a lot of headlines by switching to an all plant menu. And, you know, obviously plant-based has been fairly big in the food industry for a couple of years. We saw Epicurious 
yep. that home cooking site made that switch. And there was a lot of news earlier this year with people making that shift to plant-based, uh, you know, meals. But I'm just wondering, in your mind, do you think this trend can really maintain its current trajectory? It seems like it's skyrocketing right now. But personally, I'm sure I'm not sure that all of America is ready for this trend. So I was just wondering what you're kind of seeing, especially now that we do have 11 Madison Park making that shift, you know, at the high dining uh, level. Yeah, I mean, that was that nobody saw that coming. I mean, I've known Daniel since he arrived in New York from San Francisco uh, when that was still Danny Meyer's spot. And um he and Will just did an amazing job turning that restaurant around and then eventually buying it. He's if, if, So if anybody can pull off what he's trying to do, he can. He's absolutely a brilliant, brilliant chef. But to your point, um, there's still a question mark. You know, you think of, I mean, he's he's like in the stratosphere, right? So 11 Madison Park, when they reopened, I'm sure within 15 minutes of when whenever the computer system went live, they were sold out for two months. That's just the way that restaurant is. It's a destination. Uh, will people go there a second or third time after this when there's no caviar, no foie gras, no lobster, no langoustine, no fish protein, no venison, you know, all the sort of accoutrement of fine dining that we're used to seeing in a 10, 12 course tasting menu that builds up in layers? I don't know. That's sort of a, 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 a good guess. But if anything, they do what he can. But to your broader question, yeah, I mean, Epicurious, that was crazy, right? Epicurious opened in 1995. They're like one of the oldest, you know, food data. When the internet was, you know, we, we all had AOL and it was dial-up, right? I mean, that's Epicurious when they when they began. And yeah, they're not doing any meat content. You, you're, you're seeing this across the board. And I think it's going to continue. I think there's a lot of, you know, sort of blowback against eating beef for a bunch of reasons, whether it's ethical, whether it's climate change, whether it's the efficiency. I mean, of all of the meat proteins, you can debate how it works, but it's, you know, it takes roughly six pounds of feed for a cattle to gain a pound. So it's the least efficient thing to raise versus pork, which is half of that, and chicken, which is about a third of that. Um, and it also seems to me just generationally, when I look in New York, dining at restaurants, looking around who's eating near me and what they're eating. For years in America, like vegetarianism or a ver whatever version of it there is, you know, it was like 3%, 2%, somewhere in there. I think it's way bigger than that now. I think there's just a lot of people, especially younger people, who have opted for some kind of very limited meat protein, pescatarian, or full-on vegan vegetarian. And so, yeah, I think that's a trend that's not going to go away. I think it, and, and in a lot of ways, it's it's healthier. And I see older chefs. I, I can think of uh, Marco Canora, who came up with Thomas Calicchio at Kraft, and he's had um, he's he's been in New York for years and years and years. And you know, I know that for his his own health reasons, he switched his whole menu up at Hearth to just much much healthier offerings. So much more vegetable, much more grain. Um, he's the guy that has that brodo, the soup concept too, which is a smart idea. That's a great way to get meat protein in a different form from bones. But yeah, I think that's a trend that's not going to go anywhere but accelerate. I think that uh, generationally, younger people are just less interested in sitting down to a 16-ounce T-bone steak and a baked potato and much more interested to go to Superiority Burger and see what the hell they're doing that's so delicious with no meat. Like, how do you do that? So yeah, I, I, that's a trend that's not going to go away. It's going to accelerate. And I would agree with that. I think that, you know, what we're seeing too is just the rise of the flexitarian. So not even a full-time vegetarian, but even if you're eating two or three meals a week as a vegetarian, it's going to have a fairly, you know, impactful, uh, you know, movement on the food industry overall. It's really interesting to see that. And I agree, it is kind of skews to the younger demographics. I look at my own family and see younger cousins that are vegan. And I agree because, you know, even like five, 10 years ago, vegetarian almost had a negative connotation in some circles in this country. So it's interesting to see how that kind of cultural shift has happened. And, and I, I think, think you, maybe, it's sorry to interrupt you, but maybe even in your diet, I, I know that, you know, if I go back to me 20 years ago, I was eating a lot more meat, a lot more beef and a lot bigger portions. And then at some point for health reasons, my own health, and I think a lot of people are just saying, hey, you know, how do I suddenly go from this weight to 25 pounds over that? And now I'm taking pills for cholesterol. And I know that my diet really changed just kind of normally 
to shrink that meat protein down, I buy really clean meat. I go to certain butchers where I know it's it's grass fed and it's local. I'm lucky I live in Manhattan, so we have access to that. But I don't eat a whole lot of it. And the portions are smaller. And I've absolutely doubled or tripled the amount of vegetables I eat every night for dinner, vegetables and whole grains. And you might have seen that yourself. I just see a lot of people are making those changes on their own because the health outcome is obvious. Yeah, and I think we can kind of go into that because the plant-based trend really seems to walk hand in hand with that. And I was just wondering, you know, with your viewpoint, and you kind of brought it up a couple of times here with some of the chefs that you mentioned, how they're shifting to healthier, uh, you know, menus. But just what, what's your viewpoint on the evolving consumer demand for healthier products? You know, is this hitting a, a higher trajectory? Is it because of the coronavirus pandemic? Or did you see these trends even before that when people really, you know, at least in my mind, I think, March 2020, we saw a massive shift in the way people were eating and supplements and everything, and just more of a focus on health in the face of the pandemic. But my personal view is that this has been happening for years. And it was really that the pandemic was a, a shove uh, in that direction after people were already kind of trending that way anyway. But I was just wondering your perspective in the New York dining scene. Was this something that you saw before the pandemic as well? Yeah, no, I think you nailed it with that again, that, the, the last sentence. The, yeah, it, it, it had been taking place and I'd seen it in the industry. Chefs have been real cognizant of the fact that even for the A, their own health and B, the health of the customers and the, and, and the dining public in general, that healthy eating is just once once the cat's out of the bag, it is. And you're completely correct. The last year was just an accelerator for that trend. You know, people got to spend a lot more time at home, think and read and, you know, dive in the deep end of that. So take like the, the what's it called, the impossible burger or whatever that thing is, right? I mean, if you would have told me three years ago that someone's going to make fake hamburger meat that looked like a burger and try and sell it to the public, I think, yeah, maybe the freezer section of Whole Foods or, you know, it'll fly in Berkeley or Bryn Mawr, but, you know, come on. And uh, it's crazy. Right. So the success of that was almost just like it's kind of like telling that that's kind of where we're going. There's people are looking for substitutes that aren't meat based. Now, I would also argue that if you, you know, if you look at the Impossible Burger and what it's made out of, you know, which is some kind of soy protein concoction. I mean, the ingredients are that it's like some sort of soy that's by the time they're done turning it into this, it's of no value health-wise, but it's soy. And then there's two fats. It's like coconut oil and sunflower oil, and then, you know, methyl cellulite or some kind of starch. It's a really weird mix of ingredients. And yet, you you drive in a Burger King, it's on the menu. You drive into any fast food place, and they have a version of that on the menu now. So, yeah, that's that's just a real tell. So does that mean, is that like a table stake for a restaurant now to have this vegan slash vegetarian option, even in, you know, fine dining in the city? Do you need to have something like this at this point because of this rising trend? Or, you know, I know there are certain companies, I mean, not that this is in your world, but Arby's, their CEO came out saying, you know, no way we're sticking to what we know. So I know there will always be outliers, but to your point, you know, it seems like it's just table stakes from McDonald's all the way up to 11 Madison Park. It's like, you need to have some kind of vegetarian option right now. Otherwise you're not a not a super significant portion of your customer base, but you know we're talking three to five percent of overall consumers. Is this something that you need to to address? Yeah, no, it's it's ab- absolutely you, and not, not just have a vegetarian option, but have a really strong program. Like you want that might be your lead foot forward, is saying, hey, if you want to come to, to my spot and just eat fish and vegetables, or you know, no, or, or or a little piece of protein and vegetables, or just straight on whole grains of it. Yeah, that's where that's our strong suit. And it's crazy because I think when, when you and I spoke last, I remember when I was cooking in kitchens in New York in the 80s and 90s, you'd get the occasional, you know, a ticket would come in. OK, we got a vegetarian. I need a, veg- a vegetable entree. And you would just it was like, OK, let's what are the we, <laughs> we have sugar snap peas, tornado carrots, broccoli florets. We have we just you just cobble stuff together from other, you know, other dishes that were on the menu. Nobody made any effort outside of the box. It was just OK. Let's just throw some stuff on a plate that's that's green and leafy or or or, or vegetables and make it. And now it no 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 no. Now people are really serious about it. you. Got to eat. That's again that could be your lead foot. That that could be maybe more important than the proteins because the proteins take care of themselves. So just have a few more questions here, Mike. And one of the things that's really timely is this week we saw that it seems that the to go uh, New York uh, alcoholic drinks. <laughs> 
um, you know, I don't even know what to call it. I guess the emergency measure that allowed that to happen seems to be ending. I know a lot of restaurants were waiting until July 5th. It seemed that's when it was going to go, but it seems like it might be a little bit earlier. But I was just wondering, what's your thoughts on this? Is this a big miss for New York City? Should they be keeping this program in place? Or is it a good thing that, you know, basically you got to be at the bar to drink it? I'm not going to curse. Okay, I'm going to (laughs) try. When that, I guess it was yesterday or the day before, I was in in the city and, you know, in between every year, you'd log onto your your social media. Everybody was apoplectic, and everybody had these memes they were sending out. Like, "Are you kidding me, Como? Like, seriously? Like, we're just crawling out of a year from absolute hell." Those of us who have made it with PPPs, with restaurant relief funds, with furloughing, impl- we're just digging out, and now you're going to just punch us in the stomach. Because there was no warning. Yeah, it was supposed to have been like a month later or three weeks later or something. And, you know, I don't know where that the timing for that came from. But restaurants hate it. It's just it's a nightmare because, I mean, it's no secret back to restaurants profitability. You know, food cost varies, but it's generally your eyeball should be around 30, 32, 33 percent of of of, of on, as an overall expense expressed in percentages. And the great thing about selling liquor is, you know, you open up a bottle of gin or vodka or whatever, and you make a drink, and the first two or three drinks you pour pays for that, and the rest is profits. So, I mean, restaurants have always made a ton of money selling cocktails and beverages because there's no labor associated with it outside of a bartender or somebody pulling a cork. And, yeah, to have that cocktail program pulled out was just a nightmare. Places were just seriously, like, no. So I don't, I'm, I, I, I would, I'm not in the industry anymore, and I was like, Jesus, come on, what the hell were you thinking? I mean, come on, man. Do you think that there's going to be enough pressure that it might be able to be switched back up? Or do you think that this is going to be something that's just back to normal and, you know, not going to happen anymore? Yeah, I I don't think I don't think it's going to happen anymore. I don't think the restaurant industry has. It's also I mean, I can this is New York again. So it's also sort of the dysfunctional New York politics with the the disconnect between Albany and, and, and Manhattan or the boroughs. Uh, Albany and New York City in general, as there's always just been this tension. Um, uh, not related to this, but on on the good news side is it looks like they're extending the outdoor dining to almost semi-permanent status, which has been a lifeline for a lot of restaurants. Um, if you have a car in New York and you park on the street, you, you I think you're short 18,000 parking spaces. So there are people that don't like it, but restaurateurs have been thrilled with that. That's been a real lifeline because it also, you know, back to practicality again, if you had a, a 60 or 70 seat restaurant pre-pandemic, obviously it was all indoors for the most part. And then suddenly you, you had 35 or 40 seats outside and now you can keep those seats weather permitting, you know, your, your rent's the same and your dining rooms expanded by 25 or 30% with outdoor seating. And the city's been really creative about that too, which has been great. Again, I live on the Lower East Side and I know the same thing with the West Village is, you know, they just looked at traffic and said, you know what, we're just going to close certain sections of certain streets to traffic now. Um, they'll have to get around it. You know, the Uber guys will have to figure it out, but this way it allows in a much safer fashion you know, Rivington Street or Stanton Street or Orchard or Ludlow or Canal in certain sections, we're just going to have, these are going to be dining rooms. So that's, that's been great news for restaurants. The the liquor thing's a nightmare, but good news is people are going out. Restaurants are allowed to see people outside. And uh, I think we're going to be in for a hell of a busy summer and the third and fourth quarter of the year should be just crazy. Yeah, I think that's one of the silver linings from the pandemic is just like, I, at least personally, as a consumer realized how much I enjoy eating outside. (laughs) <laughs> and it's kind of interesting, you know, I'm also, I'm Jersey based, so we get those winters and obviously you can't do it year round here, but really did realize how much, you know, enjoy being out, maybe not so much in nature, but just being out in the elements a little bit and enjoying your meal. It's kind of a more rustic way of doing things, even if you're in, you know, the busiest city on the planet, it's definitely a different perspective. And I think people and consumers are going to like it. And also that added benefit where there's a lot of people that are unsure still, we've been vaccinated uh, you know, the Delta the Delta variant is out there. I think there is a little of concern. So it should help, I would imagine, New York dining establishments having that outdoor patio kind of space, you know, through the summer as people get a little bit more acclimated to this post-pandemic period. Yeah, completely agree. And I'm with you. It's funny now that we're, you know, in, how so much has changed in the last month. Um, my building in New York City was, you know, you had to wear a mask to leave your apartment. The elevators were only one person or family members together. 
uh, you, when, you know, you were carrying a mask in your pocket or wearing it everywhere you went. And now, you know, I, I was, I know they changed it in my building last week. Now you know, I was in the, in the hallway the other day, got out of the elevator and I saw a family coming in with masks and I said, Oh no, I thought it should, no, we're wearing it. Our daughter's not mask. You know, she hasn't gotten vaccinated. So we're just trying to set an example. So yeah, we're all in that sort of in-between mode of should we go in or should we not go in? But the outdoor dining thing has just been great. And yeah, to your point, that's so why I live in New York and Cape May and, Kate May, I was terrified for the restaurants last year down here, but the weather cooperated. And to your point, yeah, I mean, people were suddenly sitting out in what had been a parking lot, you know, under some kind of canopy and, you know, breathing the salt air, enjoying a meal outdoors. It was like, whoa, <laughs> I, could, I could get used to this. This actually beats being inside. So it's funny how that happened, too. Yeah, I do think that'll be one of the longer term trends as we will see more of this outdoor seating and people really kind of sticking to it. It's one of those things that they were maybe not completely, you know, it wasn't their first time eating outside, obviously, but, you know, the the dining experience usually is so inside, cold, dark, you know, low light. And I think people really kind of enjoyed getting outside a little bit. So be interesting to see. And on the other hand, you know, obviously restaurants were able to seat people outside. The other thing we saw was a lot of delivery. And I think earlier you were talking a little bit about ghost kitchens. So I'd kind of like to just go into that a little bit. You know, how many of the restaurants that you frequent, you know, did they turn to delivery? Is it something that a fine dining establishment, you know, just did to survive the pandemic? Or do you think that this concept, either ghost kitchens or just delivery in general, is this something that, you know, the higher level restaurants in New York City are going to kind of adopt going forward? Or is this something that they're like, as soon as I don't have to anymore, I'm wiping my hands clean and moving away from it? I think your last, again, your the last thing you said, for most restaurants, it was the only game in town, right? If you wanted to keep your staff employed and keep the lights on, you had to do delivery. <clears throat> but that said, as a chef myself, you know, the food that we cook, none of it was ever designed to be cooked and then put in some kind of plastic or cardboard and sealed up and then you wait for 20 minutes for the guy to come put it in his backpack and then bicycle it across town that just isn't that's not what we do and how we cook and how the food's designed so i think as soon as restaurants can stop doing it they will and the fees were crazy i mean mind you they they kind of i forget what the exact law was that de Blasio put in you know what what uber eats and would grow what the way they were charging the restaurants was you know 20 30 percent was just what but it was you know they, that was the only game in town i you know we went from i think there was a hundred thousand kids doing deliveries on bicycles electric bikes at the, at the height of last year so i don't think that's going to continue I, don't, I think restaurants don't want to do that but the ghost kitchen thing is really interesting we'd already seen food halls taking off um, whether it was that huge timeout in New York and Brooklyn or the, I mean, they're all over the place now, all over the city now. And, and they're really tempting for small operators because the initial operating costs are just so much lower than, than bricks and mortar. If you have the foot traffic and you can do volume and you're paying literally a percentage of what you'd be paying for a brick and mortar, you know, commercial lease, why not? And out of that came the ghost kitchen, which I didn't see coming in a million years. But you know, that's the concept that works really well for delivery. You know, we've seen chefs tweaking recipes. Okay, what does travel well? How about a fried chicken sandwich? That actually travels pretty well. Let's do that as a concept. Or let's do pizza, but not traditional pizza, because pizza doesn't, a lot of it, you know, the real thin crust stuff doesn't like to be in a box. It gets steamy and it gets soggy. But let's tweak the pizza crust thing and let's do a great delivery pizza. And you're seeing that. And again, for all the obvious reasons, the startup costs are really, really, really low. Um, you could be running two or three kitchens out of one location for next to nothing. I mean, there was a kid I remember doing a story on that wanted to do a, a, a fried chicken cutlet sandwich, couldn't get it off the ground, made a deal with one of the hotels in Midtown that, was, that, that their kitchen was just mothballed, you know, made a deal for like next to nothing a month and built a business up. And ended up doing so well after four or five months of using the Hyatt or whatever kitchen it was that he took over a, uh, a sweet green that had closed that was a bricks and mortar. So I think you're going to see that the ghost kitchen concept and the delivery concept are going to come out of this in a way that no one thought of. Because that trend of people getting food delivered preceded COVID. And it's funny, it was like a generational thing, right? Uh I, I hated it because I'm, a, I'm an old New York guy, but there were a lot of people that like kids, younger people that lived in New York that just love the convenience of picking up the phone and getting stuff, you know, 
watch a Netflix on your computer and eat takeout. That was a thing to do. And I'm like, why? You live in New York. Why don't you go out? That's the point of the city. But I saw this trend accelerating and COVID just set it on fire. So yeah, I think the ghost kitchen and delivery thing is going to be a whole new wrinkle in, in the restaurant world and a good one. So looking at the time, unfortunately, I think we have to bring this conversation to a close, Mike. And I just want to ask, you have any final words for our audience? I'm thrilled that the country's where it is. Um, most of the countries where it is, uh, considering where we were 12 months ago. And I'm just uh, constantly a cheerleader out there for my industry. And I think that, again, people are just chomping at the bit to get out. Uh, you know, it's funny you mentioned about the takeout thing. The other day, U Uber Eats had a, uh, what was it, a 30% off up to $20 promotion. And I was in New York and I was getting ready. And I was like, yeah, you know, I don't want to do this. And I actually went to the, went online and there was a Chinese place and I had this order and I looked at, the, and by the time I was done with the, you know, tipping the driver and this and that, it was, I said, you know what? <laughs> I'm not going to drop $42 to have food. I'm going, it's a nice day. I'm going to get on my bicycle and go eat. So no, my, my, my MO in the next six months is to just support New York restaurants, go out. And, and um, I think that, I think the restaurants are just going to be, it's going to be a great, especially the third and fourth quarter of the year, if we can get tourism back into the cities as well. So thanks again, Mike. And that brings us to the end of another episode of the Food Institute podcast. Remember, if you're new to the Food Institute podcast, please follow, like, and share. If you'd like to learn more about membership, advertising, or sponsorship opportunities, take a look at the links in our description to learn a little bit more about us and what we can do to help you with your business. So until next time, this is Chris Campbell signing off.